Welcome to the Embodiment Podcast. This show is for you if you see the body as more than a brain taxon. It's for people interested in coming home to the body as a holistic aspect of who we are and how we live. Episodes contain practical tips, exercises you can take away, and interviews with specialists from around the world. I'm your host for today, Mark Walsh. So on the show today, Roy Dean. So Roy, I've actually known about for years. He's had a very good DVD series on various martial arts and uh, to the Aikido and all sorts of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, both of which he holds a black belt in, also has a black belt in Japanese Jiu-Jitsu and in Judo. Um, really doing good stuff with the martial arts in a very modern, integrated way. So Roy, very happy to talk to you today. Mark, it's a pleasure being here. Thank you. How did you get interested in the body? What was your route into these body practices? Well, you know, when I was 16, I went to Japan as an exchange student. And while I was there, they encouraged me to train in a Japanese art after school. I had a couple of different options. I could do uh, Kyudo, which is Japanese archery, or Ikebana, flower arranging. But I chose Judo. And they warned me that Judo was very severe. But I was 16, you know, displaced in Japan. And I really felt that uh, I had a lot of teenage angst I needed to get out. So Judo was a perfect fit. And... You know, kind of immersing myself in that physical culture of judo and really understanding um, what the martial arts was all about from that Asian perspective, it changed my life. It changed the trajectory of my life entirely. And once I got a taste of it uh, in judo, I just continued. I went on to Aikido, then Japanese Jiu Jitsu, and eventually um, put most of my time into Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Well, wow, so that's wild. So you were you were pretty young to be. I mean, I'm going to Japan for the first time in a couple of weeks, as it happens. But 16 years old, a long way from home in Japan. That must have been a pretty wild experience for an angsty teenager. It certainly was. Um, you know, I I was living in Alaska. I grew up in Anchorage, Alaska, and I wanted to see the world. And I went through a Rotary Exchange program, and of course, my my host families took care of me. Um, yeah, I had a really great, well-rounded experience. I lived with a normal Japanese family, a very wealthy Japanese family. And then I actually lived in a, um, a temple, and my father was a, a priest. Um, and we had a beautiful garden. It was, it was a fantastic experience. But certainly, um, there was a lot of input and not a lot of output when I arrived in Japan. And that definitely took some getting used to. Mm. Um our first guest your first guest from uh, from alaska actually so just uh, hello to our listeners in alaska there are a few from the day <laughs> you're actually based in california now though right that's correct i'm i'm in palm springs lovely and what was it you think that appealed to you so much about the martial arts because you really dedicated your life to this what what hooked you well you know there's a, a couple of different things on a very deep fundamental level i think most men want to and um, sex differences aside, I feel that men have this longing and almost compulsion to need to defend themselves, need to, to be able to physically um, take care of themselves and others. And so that quest was the initial quest when I, when I got into uh, martial arts. Um, I'd been in fights in elementary school and, you know, I got punched at a party once and um, it was a weird thing. It was like these gangs were like checking cars and they punched me through a window and you better believe I was at Aikido class the next morning, um, wanting to be the next Steven Seagal. So, you know, it's funny, you have this very fundamental desire to be able to defend yourself. And then that morphs, um, gradually over time into something more into a sense of identity and then, you know, it's, it's okay, you're a capable fighter, but then you really want to be elite amongst other fighters and you want a certain kind of respect. And, you know, I mean, all of the, the, the reasons change over time and evolve, but every step of the way, I always felt like this was my path. Yeah, and that 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 morphing, as you say, I've seen that so many times. Normally, the you know the first thing is like, "Hey, I want to get into a fight." And there's often this moment of powerlessness. I've 
I've seen in the biographies of some of the great founders of martial arts that they saw their dad beaten up like Yeshiva or the, there's a, some moment of uh, powerlessness they felt either from proxy from the father or from himself. And, you know, I had that moment of just going, well, oh my God, this is a basic manly, dare I say, capacity that I just haven't been educated in. And shit, I better do something about that, you know? And it's very practical at first. And then there's the more thing into, um, you know what, actually I'm learning about myself as a human being and it's the art itself that becomes interesting. Exactly, exactly. And I, I think that's a beautiful thing. So, you know, when people, there's a lot of, um, you know, the, the vanity of minor differences. So there's a lot of judgment between different styles of, of I mean, between different styles of jiu-jitsu than different styles of martial arts. There's a lot of judgment rendered from, you know, one in-group towards an out-group, et cetera, et cetera. But I have really ditched that kind of judgment. Whatever gets you in the door, whatever gets you started on the path. Some yoga styles are more suited, I feel, as kind of feeder styles. You yeah. know, they get you in, they get you acquainted with whatever the yoga high or whatever that tranquility or equanimity of mind um, that comes from it. And martial arts are very similar. You might start out in something like Taekwondo, where uh, rank advancement is really rapid and you know, and it's more, you're not really working with resistance against a lot of partners until later. And not everyone is, is wants to go to like a competition school in BJJ where you're just fed to the wolves on day one. Very, I mean, some guys, that's what they want. Yeah. But you know what we most people Sorry. need a progression before you go, before you go really intense. Yeah. Hard. Why don't we map out a few of these arts? Because I think you're very well placed. I did one podcast episode where I go through all the martial arts I know. So I'll point listeners to that one as well. If you're sort of newer to martial arts and you want to overview. Um, I mean, you've had, a, as you say, a kind of integrative approach. You haven't got to, I'd call it provincial. Most martial artists are quite provincial. They'll take one martial art and they'll say, right, this is the one true way. It's a kind of fundamentalism around it. Obviously, MM mixed martial arts shook that up quite a lot. Um, from traditional martial arts, but you just want to say like briefly what Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is, BJJ, Aikido, and uh, some of these other arts that you, you've studied. Yeah, absolutely. Essentially, I have trained in different forms of Jiu Jitsu, and we'll start with martial arts can be broadly broken down into two different categories: striking arts and then grappling arts. Grappling arts, um, you know. I mean, I'm starting to see more and more overlap as, as years go on. But, you know, striking arts, arts like Muay Thai, Karate, Taekwondo, Savat. This is where you're punching and kicking largely. And then you have the grappling arts, arts like Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, Judo, wrestling, etc. So I have mainly studied grappling arts. I have done some striking arts, but most of my time has been involved in the world of Jiu-Jitsu. Now, jiu-jitsu continues, it's, it's a living, breathing thing. So it will, depending on the needs of society, create different subsets, different schools of thought and different schools of practice. So Brazilian jiu-jitsu um, typically takes place on the ground. They have some transitional techniques and takedowns going from standing to the ground, but the majority of the fighting happens on the ground where your movement is largely restricted and you use space, weight, and gravity to your advantage. Now, let's go back one step. How do you get people to the ground? Well, that's where arts like judo and wrestling, uh, that's their specialty. So you take two people in the kind of free fight phase where they can walk around, there's very little movement restriction, and then you use timing, momentum, leverage, distraction angles to take this person to the ground. Mm -hmm. And, you know, different arts have different rules on that. And then if you go back one step further before people touch, um, then that's typically where the punching and kicking happens in these different arts. But there's a specific zone in there where as the person is coming in to touch you, that's where an art like Aikido comes in. It's a more unfamiliar range, but you can blend with your opponent's energy and redirect their energy as they're grabbing you in Aikido. Yeah. Once they've grabbed you, 
you t- you head to judo. And then once it's on the ground, after you've thrown them, then it goes into something like BJJ. Great. So this idea of ranges, I find quite interesting. And that people often are good at a particular range because of what they've studied. You know, they're happy on the ground or they're happy standing up, for example, is a simple, right. simple version. And um, I guess the, the sort of, we should, we've covered this in other episodes, but the kind of MMA revolution was when the traditional martial arts started uh, training with each other. And what people found was it was easier to close range than to keep range. So the arts at the closest range tend to dominate because having a Brazilian jiu-jitsu monkey jump on you is quite difficult to keep them away if you're a sort of taekwondo kicky punchy person. Yeah, that's correct. You know, it it boils down to um, if you're not sure how to maintain the distance where you have the most skill, then people will take that away from you and you'll end up in a range where you're not as familiar. And then if you don't have the specific pathways to escape, then it's really difficult to figure it out in the moment. Yeah, yeah. people don't just intuitively get that. I, I remember having done lots of Aikido coming to BJJ and thinking, oh, I'm going you know, to have some chance here. I'm going to have some way of keeping these people off my back. And it was just like, nope, tap out, tap out, tap out. Like time and like, you know, like the humiliation of it almost, you know, the embarrassment maybe is a better word. It was, it was a real shock to me. And, and sometimes it's a shock when traditional martial artists, there's this, so we talked about the range distinction. There's another distinction of traditional versus modern, right? Like you do no gi and gi, for example. Right, right. Um, you know, the range distinction and, and really, I mean, understanding um, that is, is important. I think MMA was definitely a martial arts revolution. Uh, I followed it from the very, very beginning from UFC two. Now I've, I'm not quite as enthralled. It's all kind of yeah. you know, fighting to me now, but initially it was answering all the questions that I had as a young man, which martial art would be best? Uh, how do they stack up against each other? And when I saw Hoist Gracie kicking butt in the, those initial UFCs, I kind of knew what I was doing with my judo background, but yet, there was a fluidity and a smoothness to his newaza that uh, I hadn't seen before, and I really marveled at. Newaza is yeah. the ground technique, so the, the that, that is correct. The, yeah, it, sorry, Japanese term tachiwaza would be standing techniques. Newaza um, would be the ground techniques. And this was and, a shock at the time, wasn't it? I remember like with sitting with traditional martial artists watching some of those early ultimate fighting contests and. Back in the day, MMA hadn't really evolved. It was literally karate guy, kung fu guy, judo guy, boxing guy. And it was like, wow, this is like kind of, you know, as a kid, those que- who would win Spider-Man or Superman? You know, it was, a, you know, in a fight, you know, it was like really like kid stuff. And then we we're all kind of surprised, I remember, that this sort of messy, you know, this small guy, which is the martial arts fantasy, but often not the reality, was able to... Uh, you know, in this kind of messy way, take people to the ground and then tap them out. And we were expecting sort of kung fu flying kicks and things like that. And um, it was kind of a shock to the whole martial arts world when this happened. Oh, definitely. Definitely. I mean, people that watch MMA, and you can see, I mean, I, it kind of blows me away that you can watch uh, MMA on or ESPN now, UFC signed a deal, you know, whatever, cable television. Um, it, it's amazing that people are as literate as they are with martial arts because back then i mean really only the hardcore found the ufc and then seeing seeing that uh that movie expectation defied so consistently that it wasn't like that at all it was actually about just playing the percentages um and kind of moving it to where you have your strength uh it's you know, that was that was very difficult. There was some cognitive dissonance going on with the martial arts public at large. Yeah, I think some still haven't got over that. You still see these, yeah, but, and if I were to do it, my sensei could. And it's just, yeah, it's in the realms of denial, really, at this point, sort of psychologically. Um, and it's, it's quite hard. A, a Lithuanian friend of mine has been on this journey from traditional Aikido 
and discovering kind of jiu-jitsu and other kind of mixed yeah. martial arts type things and he's, he's video recorded it and he's been getting so much pushback from the aikido community people saying well it's your aikido and, and this guy was well trained you know he's a, he was a proper second or third degree black belt with serious senseis and um you know he he was just shocked at how ineffective a lot of his techniques were when it came down to it and you know to his credit he was able to to say you know what i'm going to put down what i've spent years investing in um, and the crap he's gotten from the Aikido world is, is outrageous. You know, kudos to him for, for being able to step away, look at what just happened, and then take action to correct it. Um, I had a similar thing happen when I was, oh God, I don't know, 19 or 20 years old. Um, I was doing Aikido. I met up with a guy who was looking for a training partner in BJJ. And this guy had a high school wrestling background and he was a blue belt in BJJ. Um, not, I mean, it, it, back in those days, it was a little bit rough. It, he kind of ha- had a blue belt. I mean, his teacher was a little questionable, but I got destroyed. Yeah. And, and in not a very pretty way either. I mean, it was like a mauling and I was, I was like, what just happened? But I was definitely of that ilk where I wanted to, I wanted to correct it. I wanted to see what was going on. Where did my uh, training fail me? You know, what do I need to do to correct that? And if that means changing the art, then that might be it. Yeah, so I applaud anybody who goes through that journey. Yeah. Um, it, it's something you can discuss with more people these days. But back then, it was a, kind of a, a difficult and introspective journey that I had to do largely alone. Yeah, I mean, I, I bought your DVD on like wrist locks in BJJ because I'd spent years training in wrist locks, uh, and I was finding it impossible to make them work in a kind of sparring situation. And uh, you know, that's that's how I first heard about you, and that was God five or six years ago. But uh, I think you know, there's a wider point here for listeners, which is ultimately we'll always be confronted with reality or uh, something we've invested our ego in. And it's, mm. it's actually quite a difficult call to say, you know what, it does look like my yoga teacher is abusing people or, you know what, this martial art doesn't work. Or there's these kind of confrontations with reality that happen in different martial arts. And I, I see almost like a choice point for people. They can stay in a sort of safe fantasy, which ultimately is never going to be satisfying. It's always going to lead to a kind of insecurity. Um, or they can sort of take the hard road of actually facing up to the fact that they just got choked out or that the evidence is coming out that their teacher's an abuser or whatever it is. Do you know know what I mean by that choice point? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and we face it, we face it every day. We face it in whatever we choose to invest our time in. And, uh, you know, Morihei Weishiba, the founder of Aikido, he said, bravely face what the gods have for you. And, you know, I think taking that attitude of just, ooh, diving in rather than, oh, I don't, I don't know if I want to open that. Oh, I don't know if I want to listen to that voicemail. But actually diving in, it helps you, it helps to sensitize you to what you think your imagination. I mean, reality is not going to be as bad as whatever the failure is you have in your mind. So it's never going to be as bad as you think. So I think that people that... um can kind of t- have the courage to step back, take a, a longer view at their teacher and who might be great. And then if they're doing things that, that don't align with their values that, you know, or, or they just can't buy into the, the fantasy world yeah. that a lot of instructors create. I mean, Every time you really get into a band, like a rock band, you know, I mean, back in the day, it was, you would buy the album, you'd read the liner notes, and they kind of, they create this, you know, sonic environment that you kind of buy into with the storytelling, with the, with whatever the sonic signature is. Martial arts schools are very, very similar. You know, you buy into their presentation of the art, and, you know, sometimes if they don't interact with other schools or have a lot of guest instructors, you're an isolated island. Yeah. And yeah. it's difficult. I mean, you're seen as, as a, uh, an escapee if you, if you want to go see another island. I've been um, to Aikido for four or five years who have never been to another Aikido club, let alone another style of martial arts. 
and that that never made sense to me but i i can see why people get comfortable and they get happy and it, you know it's a big thing to go to another martial arts club and i I've, you know, when I travel, sometimes I'd visit another Aikido club and it would be a bit nervous. Am I going to get beaten up here? Am I going to be humiliated? Am I going to realize that, you know, I don't, I'm not really as in touch with reality as I thought it was? Mm -hmm. And I, I guess at least in the martial arts, there's some possibility for testing. And that, that doesn't exist so readily in some of the other embodied arts that are out there. Yeah, right. And so you have the flip side of that. You have the kind of, um, you know, expectation of like, okay, what's it going to be? Am I not going to stack up? But then after a while, if you do go, like in BJJ, you're only as good as you are. You, c it, you cannot hide behind your rank. Yeah. Still on the mat is going to be evident. So you can go to another school and, you know, people, I don't, I don't have a particularly tough look. I'll, I'll readily admit that. You know, I got a little gray in my hair. My ears aren't that cauliflowered. I'm a sleeper. And then you, you know, you're on the mat and some guy attacks you really, really hard and you handle it. You handle it. it it's, it's no problem. So once you've kind of done that, you've gone around to other schools or you've been challenged and I mean, it really calms you down. It really gives you a deep, deeply rooted sense of confidence that, you know, the confidence you get when you're only in one school Yep. And you get your rank, but you haven't really tested it against other people. I'm not talking about people within the same style. I'm talking about like, you know, go against a division one wrestler, go against uh, someone who is, you know, just a really, really tough athlete that doesn't know anything. You know, once you, once you get that, it's very brittle because your confidence isn't tethered to anything. Yeah. There's a way in which I think parts of people's brain knows that it's bullshit you know i know martial arts have never even sparred for example or never had a, never took a punch in the face with boxing gloves even and mm. and there's a way in which i think they know that that's built a, it's like a castle of sand it's built on a poor foundation and that shows as i see this in the aikido a lot as arrogance in the yoga world i see it as a sort of overconfidence in the style or the teacher you know a kind of fundamentalism Hold on. That, and it's different from a kind of calm confidence of someone that's been around and tested things out. I, I couldn't agree more. And I, I also see the overlaps. I'm deeply involved in, well, I wouldn't say deeply, but I have been studying Ashtanga yoga for a number of years. Um, and it's something that has been a huge benefit to me. I love the symmetrical nature, pardon me. I love the sy symmetrical nature of the practice. Mm -hmm. uh, I love the fact that it, it you know, in jujitsu, you end up bending your spine, you know, in kind of a concave manner. Yeah, 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 yeah. That punch oh, over. When do you ever get that counter pose? Yeah, you did back bending, don't you, if you did jujitsu? Definitely, definitely. I mean, so I found a lot of balance. I found a lot of equanimity. I've, I have a, lo a deep love for Ashtanga yoga. But, you know, when you go to these different, I mean, I've seen so much attitude in yoga. I, I, some of the attitude in yoga, I mean, against Ashtanga. Uh, and then, you know, of course, Ashtangis are, are very devoted to, to their cause as well. And so, you know, I, I don't have a whole lot invested in the yoga world. I'm not a yoga teacher. I just kind of like smile and observe and take part. But what you mentioned about Aikido, I've been doing a lot of great work with Aikido Journal um, over the last year. Mm -hmm. uh, we're doing some great media projects. I've, I've worked with some wonderful people, including last weekend, I worked with a gentleman named Bruce Bookman. Oh, the guy yeah. hired me to cross train in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. He was the first guy. I ended up being the first Aikidoist to earn their black belt in BJJ, but he was the guy who inspired me to begin cross training. And I had the opportunity to work, of working with him uh, last weekend and, you know, that's a guy who's been around, he's done it, he knows what works. He's settled. He's so settled and unconflicted with himself. It's really, he's a really inspiring martial artist. And, you know, but I, I've, that's one of the reasons I got out of Aikido. I couldn't take the attitude. The egos. Huh? Some, oh my God. Oh my God. It rubbed me so wrong. Like you, you couldn't fight your way out of a wet paper bag. It doesn't, doesn't apply to everybody. And, and yet you're lecturing me. And, it, and there's no opportunity to ever say, okay, well, let's, let's figure that out. No confrontation with reality. So you can build, build your little empire and 
build your big ego with it and it's it's it's, it's, it's never tested and I know. Uh, it gets to the point of absurdity doesn't it you know people will say well this would like i would do this and i'm thinking okay you wouldn't say that if you'd taken even 10 boxing lessons or if you'd oh. sparred once with a collegiate wrestler for example you know, you wouldn't you wouldn't dream of saying that. And I'm thinking, I I know those things at a very basic level, where I can see the flaw in what you're saying. So it's uh, it's a fantasy world for sure. But I guess what I do love about Aikido is it doesn't just bad mouth Aikido because of that lack of competitive side in, in most Aikido. There is a spaciousness to explore as well. You know, I feel like maybe this will segue us into this. This feels to me like there's different personal growth lessons in different arts. Yeah. So. In BJJ, for example, I think humility is one of them. Everyone's getting tapped out, right? right? Aikido, they tend not to learn humility, but there's other things that can be developed there. And other martial arts are more creative. You know, some of them are uh, more about confidence and bravery. Some of them are just about, you know, koika shinkai karate is just about tough, bloody mindedness, the ability to keep going through the pain, you know, that traditional Japanese way, which is a good life skill to have sometimes. So I, I kind of feel like different martial arts build different personal growth muscles. Does that make sense? I, c- I couldn't agree more. What's your you take know, on that? Like which arts do you see building which, which things? Well, you know, there are certain strengths. Let's go back to Aikido. Yeah. Uh, with Aikido, so you have this relationship between um, Nage and Uke, um, which is the person throwing or doing the technique and the person receiving the technique. Uke is the person receiving the technique. So, when you receive the technique, like it, it, for example, in BJJ, people are interested in being effective. Yeah. There's stages of development as a martial artist. You go, you just want to be effective at first, yeah. then you become efficient, and then you become playful. Yeah. At, so people are just dying to become effective. And something like ukemi or how to receive the technique or how to roll and fall, they turn that into an art form in Aikido. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful sensitivity. The sensitivity, the kind of spontaneity, the the balance, every all of that. And I mean, I'm constantly amazed when I go to an Aikido school. I'm like, oh my God, the ukemi's so good. You go to a BJJ school, Kemi's pretty not awesome. <laughs> yeah, that, there's some ugly movement. There's someone who dances, because I dance, you know, and I, you know, Aikido are the nearest that is, they're the sort of danciest martial art that's normally used as an insult, but I would say there's actually a grace to the movement, which is very useful as a life skill. And I don't see that grace amongst my cage fighter friends. <laughs> Right, indeed, indeed. And, and you know, and, and why don't they practice their ukemi more? Because no one's going to tap to great ukemi. It, yeah. it, it might save you, but, like, it's just, it's not that emphasized. So later, you know, kind of intuitive body movement on the ground, that can kind of lead you back into that realm of, of you know, autonomous, spontaneous body movement. But when it comes right down to it, um, I, you know, Aikido offers some, some benefit, and I think all the different martial arts definitely have a, uh, a you know, certain as- movement aspects that you must master. You know, in judo, I feel there's a little bit more gaman, or like you have to bear it. You have to like, it's more like kyokushin. It's like judo is heavy. It's yeah. tough. You're tired. And you have to commit yeah. to that throw, even when you're tired. And and don't even try if you're not going to fully commit. So I think some of those lessons are just so beautiful. Um, and, you know, once you, if you taste a little bit and can pull f- from some of those different arts, some of those lessons, um, I think you'll be a better human. Yeah, there's, there's things we can draw out. And I think martial arts could be much better at this. Because often people say, you know, yeah, it starts off as a fighting art and then naturally people get to a point where they're you know they're able to fight or they've won a few competitions and naturally their focus switches to the personal growth side but i don't see that being sort of very intelligently done i don't see that being designed very well i feel like that's the next stage of martial arts evolution is to really look at itself with some psychological sophistication in the same way as it's become more technically sophisticated um in terms of um you know what students are actually working on personally Rather, rather than it, the Japanese way is the sort of very long, slow way that you just train hard for 50 years and it all comes out in the wash. Um, and then the modern way is to sort of not really think about it at all. 
you know, is to just focus yourself on effectiveness and how you choke someone out quickly. So I'd love to see the martial arts take on a slightly more uh, sort of psychologically intelligent frame as they mature in the West. Oh my God, music to my ears. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and, you know, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is very, very powerful and personalized art. Um, I, I saw the potential that was started with Aikido. Aikido is a form of Jiu Jitsu, but Aikido is in a different growth pattern. Aikido is kind of contracting again. Um, you know, 60 years ago, it didn't exist. Then it went to like a million practitioners worldwide, had a rapid expansion. Now it's contracting again. Um, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Quality control no, can go right. Just less people training is what you mean, right? Less people training, you know, that generation of instructors that originally brought the, the art to the West and around the world are dying. Yeah. And so, and so, you know, I'm part of the reason I'm, of my deep involvement with Aikido Journal is recognizing, okay, what are the lessons in this form of jujitsu at this time? And how can we apply those to BJJ? Because BJJ is in a growth phase right now but in time it will be exactly where aikido is and a lot of people don't believe that but just trust me in time you know bjj will in some ways become a caricature of itself yeah, and you already see that a little bit in gi competitions where sort of increasing rules come in and weird kind of gaming strategies come in and people pulling guard like falling on their backs and totally. you know, oh, hang on a minute that's not self-defense applicable not not at all and and then but what are they doing they're developing sophisticated answers for very complicated problems against other experts but that don't apply to like practical real life self defense things and and basically so they're coming up with complex solutions for non existent problems which is kind of a backwater in martial arts and and all arts if they get you know all arts can go there but I saw the potential of BJJ. So when I launched my own vision of the art and my own academy, and now I just have an organization, my motto was discover who you are. Yeah. I want to use this powerful physical modality as a means of transpersonal you know, insight and personal expression. And I definitely feel that people, you know, are kind of coming around to that. You know, you have to kind of go through this phase of like, you know, it's all about applicability in MMA. It's all about self-defense. It's all about competition. People are really attracted to the shiny metal objects. Yeah. And that's okay, but that is, that's a, the world of power. And you can get trapped in that world. Yeah. You can, you can exist. I see it all the time. People sacrifice so much for a medal you know and i've i've competed i've won you know it's fine at, at one time i was known as a good competitor nobody remembers that and then i turned into a good teacher you know eventually people will forget i was a good teacher nobody remembers you're only in that competition for yourself and even if you win gold as a world champion and become a world champion you know there's always the lure of well that guy's two-time world champion well i'm <laughs> only a master's world champion that guy's a seven-time world champion. You know, you're never, ever satisfied. And I think the sooner people understand that, I think the better equipped they'll be to, to kind of compartmentalize competition as one part of the art, but not the complete art. Yeah, I'm glad to see that you're, you know, putting that into BJJ because I, I kind of worried as the traditional martial arts wane, you know, like, and they really are waning. Like my keto club might have six people on a night Whereas the BJJ club that my friend runs just around the corner might have 50, you know, and it's, it's, it's a really huge difference in numbers and enthusiasm, the age of the people practicing, the dedication as well. I, I just, you know, as, but as the traditional martial arts are waning in the West, I kind of worry that that personal growth aspect, which was what made them beautiful really and, and useful essentially, unless you're a you know, bodyguard or a bouncer or something, uh -huh. you lost. So it's really nice to see that people, you know, I hear it around kids' classes. People talk about martial arts are great for kids, you know, personal growth. And I'm like, yeah, what about adults? You know, it's, uh, it's, it's the same for grown-ups too. But uh, jam on that a little bit more in terms of how, okay, here's one. How would we maximize the personal growth benefits of a martial art? Oh, 
Well, I think there's the fundamental realization that you have to, to, you know, that you have to come to, or it needs to be pointed out to you that the way is through your body. Okay. It's having intellectual understanding or having knowledge. uh, And I see this in some martial arts where they, they, okay, I I have a philosophical understanding. I have a deep understanding of the techniques um, because I've seen quite a few techniques on YouTube. So I really fully understand that. And, and you go and you have that, you know, philosophical and under, and technical understanding, but it's not skill. It hasn't matured into any kind of like body wisdom, right? Because mm-hmm. it's, you haven't used your consciousness to program your subconscious yet. You have to, number one, understand how the process works and actually train yourself so you have a repeatable skill set. Okay. Then you can really start to apply it in your life in a rich and meaningful way. So it's always, you have to go through the body. And I feel like in BJJ, that's one of the, that's one of the appealing aspects of it. Yeah. You know, they're not talking about philosophy that much. I mean, you kind of feel the philosophy and blending again, you know, making that judgment call. Oh, I need to, I need to blend here. No, I need to block here. You know, kind of, judging each situation tactically and technically this is all done through the body. And I think that's really appealing because it's kind of no nonsense until later. Um, Where I think that, for example, an an art like BJJ could improve is one, a more holistic understanding of what the body needs. Yeah. BJJ is great. It's an incredible form of exercise. Like all forms of exercise, it gives you a very specific kind of high. When I did CrossFit, I had a certain kind of high. When I did powerlifting, I did a certain kind of high. When I do yoga, there's a specific high that you get. You know, and I think having jujitsu or martial arts or whatever you're doing as part of a larger mind-body training regimen is another important aspect of it. Um, I think encouraging openness uh, and cross-training is another aspect that if you can do that in that realm, it will extend to other areas of your life. You know, reduce the in-group, out-group thinking as yeah. much as possible. Um, and then finally, I think, I think bringing a little bit of meditation and quiet time back into the practice. Yeah. Um, I think that aspect in Japanese arts yeah, I would do that at my academy. I felt like, okay, BJJ is a little bit too, even though I found it extremely refreshing coming from super rigid traditional arts where you got to bow five times before you do a technique. <laughs> yeah. Right. I, I was so tired of that, that it was refreshing to just like shake hands and do the move. Yeah. But I feel that there are a couple of things that got dropped. And one of them is, you know, for example, I would bow my, my students in. Yeah. A little bit of unity on the mat at the beginning and end of class goes a long way. Yeah, BJJ can be kind of messy, man. I remember the first time I was in a BJJ and some of the teacher was like leaning on the wall, texting his girlfriend while people were practicing. And I was just like, no way, man. Coming from, you know, Aikido background of discipline. And as you say, like the coordinated movement of unity, like everyone bowing together, there's a way in which just as tribal animals, that feels really good. Um, yeah. and, you know, I like bowing as a, as a respect practice. I think there's something in that as a practice, not just as a um, empty ritual that I see. And, you know, it's also it's like, hey, you could do two or three minutes of meditation at the end of the class, just a little bit of quiet time, you know, just let, let it all settle. That's that's a pretty straightforward thing. And I, I feel like when the, the best of old and new are going to meet, something very beautiful is going to be born. I think so, too. And, you know, it's all about pulling in. You don't have to go, you don't have to go all the way. You just need to pull in the key elements that help improve the practice a little bit. Yeah. I think. And I, I think a little bit of, of quiet, just like you do savasana at the end of yoga, you know, it yeah. helps reintegrate and it kind of recenter. So you get that original feeling before you had all these attachments, you know, yeah. just that original feeling of being alive. And I, I think, I think that would, I think that'd be good for people. You know, a lot of people meditation's a little bit out there. Um, although apps like Headspace and um, it's getting easier, man. It's getting easier. I think it's becoming more more normal. 
it's becoming more mainstream and, and I think, I think that's great. You know, I mean, I do a little bit of sitting practice uh, as well. Um, but, but, you know, normalizing it, I think, especially in this age where, I mean, are we bombarded or what, dude, we've never been so bombarded mm. by media images and things, you know, grabbing your attention. Um, I think being able, we need a little bit more balance. We just got to find balance. And I think that's a step in the right direction. Yeah, it, it occurs to me that you talk about integration there, like you know, the Shavasana. It occurs to me that just a little bit of reflection I, I get is helpful. Like I see the benefits of doing things purely through the body. There's a sort of no bullshit to that. And it's the, very much the Japanese, the long, slow way. We don't talk about our feelings. We just train. And I, I think for sort of verbose Westerners, talking about things a little bit like I used to walk home from training with a friend of mine and just kind of chat about oh I got frustrated there and you know my ego came up and I should have tapped out sooner and now my elbow hurts and you know I'm such a dick maybe I won't do that next week and you know like that little bit of reflection I think on one's own process what you might not have the space for in the in the in the speed of the yoga class or the jiu-jitsu class I find very helpful as well yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's, I think that's important. And, and it also helps frame like, what am I doing? You know, what am, what, am I just some automaton going through the motions from one class to another, you know, uh, it, or are we really reflecting on, on how this can kind of, um, yeah, we just need to understand it's not about, it's not all about, it's the space in between the beats. That's just as important. Most way of putting out, and one of my teachers is actually out in California, not far from you, Strozzi, he would, every single class would say, you know, for the sake of what, what, what's your intentionality here? Because otherwise it just becomes, oh, Tuesday night, it's time for Aikido or Judo or Karate or whatever you do. And having that really clear intentionality of like, okay, this is what I'm actually working with. And I, I think that can be very helpful to remind people just like, hey, you know, whatever you're here for is cool. This is roughly ethically aligned with what I'm doing. That's cool. And remind yourself so that there's a, so you, you're orientating clearly around the purpose of your practice. I love it. I love it. You know, I, I think another aspect of martial arts that's incredibly useful, why it's part of the answer for society at this moment, um, is just who you rub elbows with on the mat. Yes. You know, it's, it's not an online echo chamber. It's not a socially gratified, um, you know, office or business environment. This is a place where white collar, blue collar, old and young, get on the mat and cross pollinate with their energy, with their intentions. And th there's something, there's something incredible. And one aspect that people don't even talk about is kind of like just being able to touch and interact with these other people physically. Yeah. I mean, you have this kind of an energetic level and then you have like the, the invisible microbiome that nobody looks at. I mean, mm -hmm. I am certain that my own immune system has gone, has been strengthened immeasurably by the tens of thousands of people I've interacted with on the map all around the world. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you can get that from kissing lots of pretty girls, but you, you know, you can always get that from being, uh, having your face in the armpits of, uh, of thousands of men and I, I almost never get ill there's a preference there but i'll take it <laughs> in terms of in terms of accessibility and ethics there's also a, there's a different fact there but no i'm with you on this i, I feel like just health wise being in physical contact but as you say cultural contact as well like i you know my world could be all yoga teachers life coaches and psychotherapists as because of what i do and when I was doing uh, mixed martial arts in Brighton, you know, like I was continuously around people with conservative views, much more, you know, working class tradesmen. It was like a whole other section of society that I just ignored. And I, I think it was the beginning of starting to understand their view politically was just sort of swearing, you know, sharing the sweat, blood and tears with them. I, yes, I, I agree. I agree. And, you know, okay, so I ran a, um, I ran a, a, a successful jujitsu academy for a number of years, and it was great to be involved. I mean, deeply immersed in physical culture. I was an audio engineer, had a media degree, and worked for a very successful production studio in in, uh, in San Diego before I got my black belt. And then once I got my black belt, I you know started my own academy, did that kind of a thing, and then after I sold the academy. 
stepping away, like, oh, I don't have to be immersed in this physical culture anymore, which is, it helps round you out as a person, you know? It's good to get exposure to that, but then it's also good to step away. And I can imagine if you're dealing with just psychotherapists, you know, um, you know whatever, body, body workers, yeah. um, you know, homeopathic healers, uh, people, people that are into kind of more esoteric woo-woo stuff, that can get kind of ethereal. And you yeah. get a little bit detached from that. And in, 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 in the same way that in physical culture, like people don't even talk about that. Like, what are, what are you talking about? Yeah, yeah. But like, it's like a re- I would say like seeing the going to see my family is a good one for this as well. But, you know, you see them, they live a little way away. And just having friends that go, what the fuck's a life coach? I don't even know what that is. You know, it just sounds, it's like I'm a plumber. You know, what do you do? You know, it's, it's, it's that sort of reality that I think is, um, much needed if you're coming from the sort of liberal arts kind of background and i'm sure it works the other way as well you know i used to have uh, kind of friends that would say wow you really opened my mind up to this hippie shit mark you know like i used to think it was all bad, but like you know i think maybe there's something in it you know like it's sort of you know i'd slip a bit of med- you know the number of a meditation teacher after class and stuff you know but it was um I, you know i think it's profoundly healthy and as you alluded to more needed in the world today than ever before Love it. Love it. Well, you know, in conversations like this, I, I think are bringing a little bit of balance to the force and people are, especially with, you know, politics and a lot, a lot of uh, strife and online division. But when you get right down to it, when you're actually in the physical presence of other people, yeah, you know, that stuff kind of the overriding commonality in shared humanity just quashes all of that. Yeah. You know? It, it, it's it's an amazing thing and, and um you know i think as we understand a little bit more about the tribalism in group out group thinking um you know the the effect of social media i mean i'm i feel very fortunate to have been around through dude the birth of the internet yeah the the greatest revolution in our time which is the you know microcomputer in our pocket I mean, so that, that, that's changed humanity. I, I feel very fortunate to be around um, for, the, for that transition. And now we're starting to understand that these social media tools, I mean, I sent something early on. I've had quite a bit of experience with social media, um, both b- the benefits and, you know, and look, I've seen people get, uh, I've seen a lot of people get snarky and, I mean, and post stuff towards other people. And it's just this like digital morass and yeah. I, and I've been, you know, we have to kind of come to grips with like, what is this? Yeah. And do I really want to put my time into this? Does this make me happy? <laughs> yeah, um, increasingly, man. One of the reasons I do the podcast is I got really tired of kind of bitchy, fighty online conversations. And I went, you know what? Who are the people I really want to speak to? Okay, I'll do a podcast. That's a good excuse to have like real conversations with those people real conversations, you know, and I'm, I'm still the guy that calls. If I want to talk to you, I will call you. And that is old. I know that's old fashioned. I'm an old man. I mean, <laughs> school, the, the kids freak old out. School. You know? kids, they're like, why would you talk to somebody? <laughs> why, are you, why are you phoning me? But like, I know it's so invasive. And, uh, no, I, I have a group of men. There's like 10, 12 of us that I have on a little list and we're all in a WhatsApp group. And I call each of them once every few weeks. I'm actually talking to two of them today. One of them is a, a creativity trainer, ex rock star. Another one's kind of into tantra. Another one's a martial artist. So they're all people that I have some shared interests with, but they live in different countries. They have different perspectives. And I actually make time in my diary as a super busy person to have those, to block those conversations in my diary. And it's a good few hours a week, which is no small commitment. Just because right. I want to be having real conversations. So between the podcast and those private, it's something for privacy as well. Like there's things I would say to my mate Jamie that I just would never say, and even as someone that's fairly outspoken, I just wouldn't say in a public forum. And I feel like we need that kind of private relationship space as well uh, as this sort of huge public thing where everyone's, you know, it's dangerous socially. Oh, I, that is great to hear, Mark. It's wonderful to hear that you prioritize that kind of like, that deeply human interaction, which is conversation, which as Sam Harris says, is really all we have. Mm. And 
the the written conversations online you know there there there's incredible information there's incredible information we're living in the most amazing age on the other hand when it comes when it comes right down to um what people share i think we're starting to realize that people overshare <laughs> you know we're, we're starting to work out the etiquette guilty guilty it's interesting technology goes ahead of etiquette you know, it's maybe a very British consideration. It took a while for people to realize they had to turn their mobile phone off in a movie theater. And now you go to the cinema and now it's just normal and there's a reminder and it's enforced and it's socially reinforced as well. It took, it took a few years of mobile phones for that, for that to catch up. You know, the etiquette is, takes time. The culture and the etiquette takes time. Okay, so when we're moving towards wrap up here, I mean, what is your sort of personal, let's make this personal again. Like what's, what's your personal growth edge with your current practice Roy like what's kind of like kicking your ass or challenging you with it um you know at the at the moment um I'm challenging myself to read I've got to stop reading on the screen <laughs> you know you this, this is, read a book? I find it hard to read a book now it's very difficult to read a book I'm, I'm I know and I, I the other night I, I read um taking the path of Zen uh which is one of many your books on Zen meditation and um, in Buddhism that I have in my collection. I'm not necessarily a Buddhist, but I'm, you know, mm. I, I have a, a, a number of spiritual books in my collection and I just picked it up and I found it captivating to read the written word on something as easy on the eyes as a, as paper. <laughs> and, and, and I want to get back into writing. I was, yeah. I've written, a, you know, I've, I've written two books on my journey, uh, Martial Apprentice and Becoming the Black Belt. And I feel like the books are good, but I would love to do something really great. Mm -hmm. And if I need, if I'm going to, in addition to all the other things I do, if I'm going to write something great, I need to be reading. And, you know, it's, yeah, I, I, I keep up on news and, and, you know, I surf the web. I'm not a submariner. I surf the web and, and get the necessary information. But it does something to your brain. I was an avid, voracious reader in my youth. Yeah. My, my, my entire family is, is definitely into literacy. And that is just not where I've been the last couple of years. But it does something, something very soothing to your nervous system when you're, when you're reading a book, particularly before bed. So, I mean, it might sound simple, but getting back to reading and some of those organic processes, I feel is, is important. And of course, my morning meditation, the, you, you look back over your life and when you look back at, you know, when was I producing the most? When was I at the height of my powers? And when you're, when you're meditating in the morning, for me, that's a key aspect. It sets the tone for the day. Yeah, yeah, that's the one thing I never skip. I, even this morning, I had an interview uh, for with an Australian podcast that I was on at seven thirty in the morning, and I still did ten minutes of cheeky meditation first because I didn't want. And I knew my day was going to be by the time that was finished. The day, you know, the day was running, and sure. I just, you know what, I'm going to keep at least ten minutes. That's that's my minimum for mental health. So that's that's the one thing I never skip out of my schedule because I just found it so beneficial. Oh, it's so, it's, it's incredible. You know, I, I've, I've been getting up a little bit more slowly in the mornings, right? So I take a walk on uh, where I live. I take a little walk. I'll maybe do an outside meditation, you know, just that kind of like those subtle hip shifts that twist your spine gently in the morning and get things going. I mean, I'm much more acutely aware of some of these postural things and how they affect your mood and your cognition. Yeah. So we need to be able to like, my real challenge is, is optimizing and I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a little bit of a workaholic. So, so being able to like make the time step away from the computer, you know, and just honor your body because you get locked in these positions, you're involved in something, you're reading something, you're in a an intense video edit, you're making a song. And you are just glued to that screen. Yeah, movement. Roy, we do need to wrap up. And uh, 
I, just a couple of things to finish them. So in terms of finding out, I really recommend your DVDs to any martial artists. They're really high quality, the ones I've seen. And I imagine you have online versions. You're at roydean.tv, right? R-O-Y-D-E-A-N.tv. That's correct. Great. Nice looking website. People out there, he's a good looking chap. I recommend uh, having a look at the nice photography on this website. And uh, a final parting message, sir, about the body. You know, the, the body has its own intelligence honor it and uh it won't steer you wrong thank you very much for joining us today uh thank you for the opportunity mark it's been a pleasure subscribe to get more and you can also leave us a review on itunes which helps with our rankings so really appreciate that um equally if you want to support the podcast even more then fund us um go to patreon give us a dollar per episode um those who don't know patreon's a really good way of supporting things you want to see more of in the world I know like so much is available for free now. And you know, what I'd say is a lot of energy and effort goes into this podcast. Um, I put it out there for free so everyone can get it. You know, more than I work on this. Everyone that wants it can have it for free. Uh, and if you want to support us, it is really appreciated. So it's patreon.com slash Mark Walsh. Uh, and of course, if you want any in-person training, you can visit embodiedfacilitator.com. There's loads more resources there too. Till next time, welcome home to the body.